that, we will move on to our next companies with Mito Material Solutions. During the 2020 coronavirus pandemic, climatologists thought there would be a great opportunity to study emission reduction. Despite hopes of a large decline, the needle barely moved. Pollution decreased by 15% or less across the U.S. despite a majority of people staying home. That's because freight trailers, one of the largest contributors of carbon emissions, were still on the road making runs delivering your food, goods, and Amazon packages. Freight trailer manufacturers have been trying to shed weight and transition to composites for decades. But the current composite technology available on the market just can't handle the payload and nobody wants a forklift falling through a trailer floor. See, composite materials are lighter than metal, but they are not as durable. They can crack, fracture, and break because the plastic or epoxy holding them together is brittle. This is one of the main reasons composites are not the go-to choice for industries looking to innovate their materials. In order to make composites more durable, they need to add something extra. Hi, I'm Kevin Keith, co-founder and CTO of Mito Materials, where we enable the use of composite materials with cost-effective additives. Mito Materials has revolutionized the polymer additive industry by creating a scalable, robust technique to functionalize graphene-based additives at an effective price. Our flagship product is Mito Ego, a graphene-based additive that is loaded into both thermosets and thermoplastics at a 0.1% concentration by weight that allows polymers to see up to a 135% increase in mechanical performance. Ego reactively disperses against itself, allowing it to be used in any manufacturing process on the market. That means by utilizing manufacturers' suppliers, there is no change in current processes. So two pounds of Ego can make either 3,000 carbon fiber bike frames or enough plastic parts for five Ford F-150s to perform like never before. Looking back at freight trailers, we know there's a need for a stronger composite in order to go the distance. That's why we've partnered with the nation's largest and most innovative freight trailer manufacturer who has been looking to transition to an all-composite trailer for the past five years. With Ego, we were able to push a cheaper material far beyond its more expensive counterpart with no added manufacturing time. We see here in this ultrasonic check conducted on our customers' panels that the addition of EGO does not affect panel consistency, proving that EGO is an easy plug-in solution. With just 0.1% EGO, we were able to increase compressive strength of this cheaper material by 20% on the low end and flexural modulus by 135%, hitting the benchmarks they needed to make their dream a reality. This will allow them to shed 40% of their trailer's weight while maintaining the same manufacturing process and load capacity, but remaining logistically and economically viable. Even if 55% of the 1.7 million freight trucks started using a composite trailer today, that would reduce fuel consumption by $12 billion, according to the North America Council for Freight Efficiency. That would reduce carbon emissions by nearly 60 million metric tons. But remember, composites are used in many different industries, from freight trucks and automotive to sporting goods and aerospace. One application that has been trying for decades to utilize composites are cryogenic storage tanks used for storing rocket fuel. Some of these manufacturers have gotten close, but with current technology and methods, it still has a long way to go. Now with just 0.1% by weight of ego, hoop stresses and moduluses would increase so dramatically that not only would this application seem viable, but the increased fatigue life, bursting pressure, and toughness would finally make this the best method for cryogenic fuels. Today, the polymer additives industry is worth $10 billion, with the graphene-based sector growing 40% year over year. Sure, there are other graphene and carbon nanotube additives on the market, but all of them are difficult to disperse, require special handling procedures, and need anywhere between 10 and 40 times more material than ours. Our processes solve these problems, allowing our products to easily integrate and disperse into any polymer our customers see fit. This enables our products to penetrate markets where no one else can go. Our go-to-market strategy will focus on the thermoplastics market because of the quicker testing cycle and clear parallel to the epoxy market opportunity. 
To do this, we work with the manufacturers to prove Ego in their products to show that they too can get drastic increases with minimal effort. We then work with their polymer supplier to integrate on the back end. That way manufacturers can utilize a Mito powered polymer with a simple change in their bill of materials. Customers are eager to get their hands on Mito. Since launching the scaled product in 2019, we have 15 piloting customers currently testing different applications and a pipeline with over 50 leads. This approach will allow us to deliver two specialty product lines integrated into our current pipeline and we are set for $124 million in revenue by 2025. But technology is half of the battle. What makes a materials business successful is the team behind the product. The team that we have assembled around Mito Materials is one that has extensive experience in B2B composite and chemical sales and manufacturing. Just like our product, we have blended the best scientific and business minds together to commercialize this opportunity. And we are backed by industry experts who work alongside us to educate an old market about new technologies. Our team is tenacious, resilient, and we know that it takes true agility and hustle to revolutionize an industry more effectively than 100-year-old companies. Since starting Mito in 2016, our team and our technology's potential has been awarded several grants and prizes totaling $1.5 million, including funds from Techstars, a NASA EPSCoR grant, and the NSF via SBIR's Phase 1 and Phase 2. That traction and track record has also allowed us to raise $1.6 million from venture capital firms and angel investors like Clean Energy Trust, who believe in our mission to empower the next sustainable material evolution by enabling manufacturers to transition to composite materials using our solutions. At Mino Materials, our goal isn't to only revolutionize how the materials around us behave is to create a platform technology that scales with industry standard equipment that affects said materials without disrupting current manufacturing processes. The team we've rallied behind us shares this vision and has the passion and know-how to make it possible. When we started Mino Materials, we knew that advanced materials shouldn't be accessible only to advanced industries. We knew that in order to push humanity to entirely new heights, We need versatile, disruptive technologies that unlocks this next frontier, a more sustainable frontier. That's why our products don't end with just one additive affecting one material. Mino Materials is here to empower the next materials evolution by making the products you use every day last longer and perform better than before. All right. Thank you, Mito. Do we have any questions? All right, John. Yeah, great. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so have there been any studies into how well the material um, is going to retain the, these improved properties over time? Um, you know, do you believe that the prolonged environmental exposure is going to degrade the properties that you've measured so far? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, We are currently doing those studies right now, um, both mechanically for fatigue life, uh, especially in flex and compression. Uh, And then we're also working on some UV degradation and severe weatherability, uh, working on lower end of the spectrum. So we're looking to do, you know, negative 20 Fahrenheit all the way up to 140, 150. So those studies are ongoing right now uh, because, of course, they take a lot of time, but it's definitely something on our docket. Okay, then, then as a follow on, uh, since you noted the NASA application, do you then plan to evaluate the material properties in the space and cryogenic environment? Yes, we're looking to get into that realm as well. Um, we're currently looking for contacts that we could work with to collaborate to get something into that sort of environment, as well as to look at what sort of testing parameters we need to perform. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. Great, uh, Paul? Hi, Kevin. Nice job. Really nice job. Two quick questions. Could you please expand on your reasoning about why this is a platform technology? Yes. So uh, we've developed a chemical process that we can take uh, other nano and micro type materials and plug it into the same process and we get different types of additives. So for instance, uh, ego is a combination of graphene oxide and an epoxide uh, silane type material 
we could swap out that epoxide silane for an acrylate, methyl acrylate, isobutyl, and it's all the same process to pump out different types of additives. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we're working on a different type of graphene oxide additive that is fluorinated to further increase the, the capacitance of composites. So making them into um, essentially supplementals to aircraft batteries. Um, it's all in the same process. So that's why we qualify it as a platform. And the other quick then follow up is what is your current IP status? patenting status or IP strategy relative to this platform technology? Yeah, so right now we are licensing two patents from Oklahoma State University. Uh, it is perpetual, exclusive, it's in ours. Uh, we are filing currently this year, we're on track to file four new patents. Uh, we filed one provisional last year, which is then going to convert this year as well. Uh, we're basing that around new formulations, so that way we have fingerprints to identify if anybody is stealing IP, and we're looking to file those worldwide as well, uh, especially in other graphene-producing countries like uh, Norway, Spain, uh, Japan, Okay. That, that way, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Ramona. Good afternoon. Uh, you made Ooh. mention of uh, NASA EPSCOR project back in 2014, I see, and then uh, phase one, phase two, SBIR. Are you actually into the phase two or past it, or what, what is your status on that? Yes. So the SBIRs that we have are with the National Science Foundation. So the NASA EPSCOR that we got, it was actually the grant that developed the technology back in the day. So with that grant, we were able to patent it and then do market discovery over a longer period of time. And then by the point that we thought we could really take it to market and scale it up, that's when we were able to get the phase one SBIR from the NSF in 2018. And we are currently in our phase two, uh, which is due to run out in 2022. Okay. Do, does the NSF have post phase two award possibilities? in SBIR? No, they have some, uh, no, they don't, but they have a, a different program called a phase 2B, which is essentially a two to one matching for uh, uh, additional funds for R&D. So we're okay. filing for that this year, yeah. Okay, we do have something like that. Have you tried the NASA SBIR? We did. Um, this year, It's we, we didn't get it, but we do have a customer that is still really interested in developing this fluorinated graphene oxide material. So we're going ahead and doing a JDA with them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, Alex. Hi, Kevin, no, great presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first one has to do with your, your revenues. You mentioned that you've got, I think, 15 current customers. Are you able to share with us what your current revenues are? Uh, revenues, yes. Uh, so right now it's non-recurring revenue. We're selling evaluation contracts, uh, 20 grams for a thousand dollars where they get not only product, but they get our technical expertise and use of our facilities if need be, uh, considering we have an in-house Instron dispersing equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, so as of right now, oh geez, this year we're on track for, I want to say around 50 to $75,000 in non-recurring revenue. Uh, we do anticipate a full pilot conversion at the end of this year. So at that point, we should have a more recurring revenue. And uh, oh, actually, just as of last week, we are going to be implemented into a, a pair of custom skis. So uh, they're buying a kilogram yearly at this point. Uh, they're going to be putting us into 100 skis to start. And we anticipate that ramping up to a couple hundred by the mid middle of next year. Awesome. And then my second question has to do with environmental impact. So I, I really like what you said at the beginning of your presentation about you know how much carbon this will save. Uh, there's currently, I guess, another uh, environmental crisis unfolding in the form of microplastic pollution. And my uh -huh. question is whether your invention here is going to help or hurt in that regard. Uh, great question. So I think it depends on the frame of mind with ego, especially um, if you are helping now, mind you, the microplastic is single-use plastic that's been tossed. What we're gearing towards ego is more 
uh, engineering type plastics that are meant to last for a while. And so we're looking to prolong this life so it prevents it from going into a landfill. Now, other products we have coming down the pipeline, we're on schedule for scaling up a starch variant this year, uh, which you wouldn't have thought that cornstarch could do something like this, but it's performing better than Ego. Uh, we're going to be doing some biodegradability mm -hmm. studies to see how that affects uh, plastics or even if it biodegrades itself. So studies ongoing for that one, but all in all, we're anticipating with increased fatigue life and modulus, uh, Ego will definitely help with that. You mentioned some some UV testing earlier. Do you have any results there yet? Not yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Nancy. Hi, this is Nancy Mendonca. I second a um, great presentation. And can you talk a little bit about your thoughts towards meeting aviation aircraft certification requirements? Yeah, great question. So we haven't explored exactly what it would take. Uh, to meet those certifications just yet. Um, we've dabbled a little bit, asked some people around, some suppliers, and it seems, considering we are a, a specialty type product going into a material, we don't have to meet as stringent of verification, whether it's ISO or AS uh, type standards. So I'm not necessarily sure what it takes to get to that point, but we do operate internally under ISO standards, gearing ourselves towards uh, getting to that point. Now, when it comes to large scale manufacturing, we are using a contract manufacturer that makes specialty pharmaceutical type materials. So they have the facility uh, that is well outfitted for our type of material, and we're looking to fully implement into their facility uh, in the next two-ish months. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, so you, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the growth of the, the graphene and the plastics industry is really taking off. Uh, you know, you said 40% per year, um, mm -hmm. but it also means that there's some very well-established large players, uh, BASF, Kaneko, Sumitomo. Are, do you view them as customers, distribution channels, competitors? Uh, what is, where is your place in the, in the overall, uh, ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of these companies don't make graphene or graphene oxide uh, for whatever reason. A lot of these companies are making carbon black, carbon nanotubes in select cases. I know Avonic makes nano silica. Uh, so in a sense that they make other additives, they are competitors. Now, we're something entirely new on the market. Uh, in the early days, we would have to uh, shoot down the concept that we are carbon nanotubes just because they had such a bad rap. But now we're to the point that people realize the benefits of graphene and its derivatives. So utilizing people, you know, like uh, Sumitomo or Tejan as distribution partners or even uh, polymer infusion specialists, that's that's our go-to. So we're working with people like uh, freight trailer manufacturers and Ford and uh, other plastic suppliers or consumers to qualify within their systems and then we get intro to then compound on a much larger scale from their supplier thanks kevin yeah chandra yeah i just wanted to clarify back on your ip so you said mm -hmm. that the portion of it is licensed currently but you're looking to do a provisional um with the provisional that you're filing replace the current process, or is that an addition on? Ooh, I don't know how much I want to disclose. Um, so it is a new patent, but mm -hmm. it is still ego. That's as much as I can say. Last year we filed the provisional, but we're building on top of that with a lot more information that we learned in the past year. So it's not altering the product that we're sending out right now. So would your company going forward still require the licensed um, IP from the university? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, tough to say right now. Um, I think, you know, over the next couple of years, we wouldn't need it, but we still want to keep it in our back pocket just so it can't be licensed away to anybody else. And we're still the only people on the market that can do a POS mm -hmm. plus graphene or graphene oxide. Um, and to follow that, um, do you have an exit strategy for your company? Are you looking to build it or be acquired or, yeah? 
both. So we believe that it's going to get to a certain point that uh, we're going to have to bring manufacturing in-house. Now, mm -hmm. of course, that requires a lot of equipment, putting you know assets in the ground. Um, there are plenty of acquirers out there that are have been buying up different additive and specialty polymer companies. Uh, you know, Henkel, <clears throat> B BYK, uh, BASF, Avonic, all of which, and even Solvay, uh, we've been talking to all of these people and courting them for a couple of years and developing those relationships. So as we're growing the team in the marketplace, we are working alongside these potential acquirers, not only to get into their products and to use them as distribution channels, but also setting ourselves up for an exit plan. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and Rich? Thanks, Robin. Uh, hey, Kevin, we spoke earlier this year. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, one, because you're, you're using graphene or graphene oxide and you're um, creating new kind of mixtures in certain types of plastics and other types of materials. Have you ever considered um, electric conductance in a material? I, I, in particular, I'm looking for a hydrophobic um, uh, metal air battery cathode layer that that puts some um, that takes electric conductance through that hydrophobic layer using graphene or graphene oxide. Is that something that you might be able to uh, invent or look at? Or uh, it, yes, to all of it. Uh, so we we've seen with ego we decrease conductivity by I believe in planar it was sixty eight percent and volumetrically by eighty six percent. And that's held true uh, with carbon fiber in the system and whatever epoxy we go into. Uh, so we are developing an additive that is going to be fluorinated to further increase that band gap to make it even uh, more insulating. So we, we're toying with the idea right now, doing some proof of concepts to see what we can do. But it's it's definitely something that we're looking at. We're looking to uh, really grow with the industry because we know it's... A little conceptual right now now when of course you look at graphene and graphene oxide graphene is uh highly conductive and graphene oxide is less so but it seems whenever we put our materials in there uh it, it drastically insulates which is really interesting okay and, and the other question i had was um i'm connected quite closely to a large um, manufacturer of graphene that says it can provide the best bulk price on uh, graphene anywhere so if you're interested in that i can make that connection for you at some point uh interesting yes please yeah. i'll uh, i'll touch base with you after this sure okay thank you if not thank you mito appreciate it thank you guys <laughs>